I mentioned a moment ago that today is the first Sunday of Lent, which is a period of time from Ash Wednesday to Holy Saturday, the day before Easter Sunday. And it is characterized as a season of renewal. And each day during the Lenten season, uh, we have been taking a journey through the unvarnished Jesus. And as you have maybe watched some of those, we are doing a short little uh, scripture reading and a thought that follows that. But I wanted to complement that journey with a Lenten series on Sunday morning. And this series that we're going to be in for the next six weeks is called Curator, Repairing the Damaged Frames. Uh, what is a curator? I don't know if you are familiar with this position. A curator is in charge of different collection and exhibits of paintings that are found in a museum. And curators are given the charge to make the objects or archives or pieces of art displayed in such a way that they can be properly interpreted by the people that are going through the museum. Now, whether you realize this or not, what we have on record about the life of Christ is a curated exhibit. And what I mean by that is we have four Gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These four Gospels have kind of their own perspective and emphasis, but they're not the only Gospels. Uh, the early church chose to curate which ones would become what is called canonized, that is, belong in the Scriptures. But there were more Gospels than that, if you wanted to do a little bit of uh, footwork and investigate this. But the early church believed that these four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, give the best representation of the life and teaching of Jesus. So what you have is a curated exhibit in the New Testament. And as we come to this uh, new series, Curator, what we also need to understand is that when we open the Scriptures and we read about the life of Christ, we in a sense are curators ourselves because we tend to frame Jesus in numerous ways, and it's unavoidable. There is not a piece of anything that you read that you don't, do not also bring an interpretive lens to. In other words, there's nothing that sits as a piece of literature or poetry or even a news article that you don't already bring an association of experiences and expectations from what you're reading, and you impose that a little bit upon what you are reading. Now, that's okay, we all do this, but sometimes what happens is our expectations of what we're reading causes us to kind of misrepresent what the original author is trying to emphasize. And so when we tend to curate our reading of the Scriptures, we have to double back a little bit and ask the question, have we damaged the frame that we have put this exhibit in? And I really do believe the church at times has, instead of just taking the text for what it says, has often brought traditions and has brought uh, certain systematic theologies and has imposed it upon the text. So what I'm trying to do over the next six weeks is in the major events of the life of Christ, and in a moment we're going to talk about the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, we need to double back and we need to say how have we framed this in such a way that maybe we have missed the point or maybe we have underestimated the point that it is making. Now this piece of art here is an abstract. And so as you look at it, you might be interpreting it in a variety of ways. And that's what we tend to do when we open the Bible. But I think we, the one thing that we can see is this painting here, because Jesus' hands are tied down here, that this represents the arrest of Jesus, correct? So this isn't Jesus sitting by the well with the woman at the well in the area of Samaria. No, he's got a thorn of crowns around his head, and his hands are tied. So one thing that we're able to agree on as we interpret this painting is this is about 
the arrest of Jesus. And yet at the same time, what you see in this painting, or what you don't see in this painting, might be through your own interpretive lens. But the one thing that we can take away from this painting is this is Jesus when he was arrested just prior to being crucified. So when we come to the teachings of Jesus, when we come to narratives about his life, of things that happened in his life, there are things that we can be in agreement with, even if we don't necessarily all land in the same spot of how we interpret it. Does that make sense to everybody? So that's why there are so many different traditions within churches. You have Methodists and you have Baptists and Lutheran and Presbyterian, and there's different emphases that are often placed upon the text because of the way it has been interpreted. The thing that we really want to be careful of is not to damage the picture itself. In other words, if I was to come with uh, two by fours and try to frame this, or if I tried to came, come with six by eight pieces of wood and tried to frame it, all of a sudden the picture itself might be marred by what I frame it with. Does that make sense? So what we have to do is keep the picture in mind without being overwhelmed by what we surround it with. So over the next six weeks, we're going to be careful of the damaged frames that are often put around these events in the life of Christ. And what we want to do is make sure that we see the painting itself. So you're a curator, I'm a curator as we look at this text. So if you have a Bible, turn to the passage that I read for you this morning. This is Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 through 11. Now, the thing to keep in mind as you read this account about the temptation of Jesus for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness is that just prior to this was the record of his baptism. So at the end of chapter 3, we're told that John the Baptist, who was leading people in a baptism of repentance, um, baptized Jesus as well. And the event that is notable in Jesus' baptism is there is this recognition that Jesus is the Son of God. God himself says in the uh, baptism paragraph, this is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. That's the last verse of chapter 3. Now when you go into the temptation account, you've got to keep that last verse in your mind. Because I think that's the heart of what we're trying to understand about the temptation of Jesus. So the number 40 is pretty significant in the scriptures. Uh, the nation of Israel wandered in the wilderness for almost 40 years. Jesus is in this wilderness place for 40 days and 40 nights. And what we find is that there is a parallel and it is intentional. Jesus here is the loyal son of God, and he is the true Israelite, if you will, the one that is following God's lead. Israel had been called the sons of God in Exodus chapter 4, verses 22 and 23. So they had failed their mission in many respects, but here is Jesus, and He's going to fulfill the expectations of what it means to be a son of God. Now, when you look at these temptations, you would say, well, that's not much of a temptation because you can't relate to it. Turning stones into bread, throwing yourself down off the high point of the temple, um, bowing down to Satan to be the ruler of all the kingdoms of the world. I mean, what is going on here? Well, these type of temptations are far removed from our own lives, but the central point of these temptations is very close to what we are tempted with as well. So think about this for a moment. So he has already been called the Son of God. So that's his identity. He is the Son of God. Most of our temptations usually are related to to how we identify ourselves. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. You see, if the devil came and he didn't come to Jesus in a red suit with horns on his head, long tail, and a pitchfork, 
That's a cartoonish character of the tempter. But whatever influence this is, this supernatural influence, did not come and say to Jesus, Hi, I'm the tempter. I'm here to tempt you. Actually, he begins to play very subtly into Jesus' identity. You see, the tempter comes disguised with some good ideas. And that's where we are often tempted as well. There's a trilogy here of temptations that at the surface level seem to be good ideas. Three good ideas. If Jesus could turn bread, or stones into bread, he could feed everyone and solve the world hunger problem. That's a good idea, isn't it? If um, he could call upon the army of angels, there would be no one that would be able to oppress other people. He could liberate everyone. If he was the ruler of all the kingdoms, well, obviously that persuasion is that he is the king of kings and lord of lords. So these three ideas are not like the devil comes and says, hey, I'm going to tempt you to become a bank robber. Are you following what I'm saying? These are things that are related to his identity. You cannot tempt a person with which they are already resistant to. I'm not going to become a bank robber. I'm not going to be tempted to become a drug dealer. No, that's not where temptation is going to come into my life. It's going to come somewhere in my identification. What the tempter promises to Jesus is... You are the Son of God. You can do some tremendous things. But here's the problem. The bigger picture itself is this. Give up your identity as the Son of God. Give up your identity as the Son of God. Bow down and worship me. So the first temptation is, hey, you have the ability. You have the power. uh, You're able to perform miracles. Why don't you turn... First, these stones into bread and feed yourself. And while you're at it, why don't you feed everybody else? And Jesus did do a couple of miracles like that, didn't he? He fed 5,000 on one occasion. He fed 4,000 on another occasion. And there were times through the Old Testament as well where God provided manna from heaven for those that were in the wilderness. So it's not a bad idea at all. But the problem is what he has to do. He has to put other things ahead of his identity. And that is, the kingdom of God has a very important part of doing good social work. However, there are more needs than just physical needs. There's also social, emotional, and psychological needs as well. And so to pinpoint only this, why don't you turn stones into bread for yourself, is kind of saying, forget about the fact that you're following God's will as the Son of God. Do what you want to do. Feed your hunger. Now, as I mentioned before, it would be a tremendous progress, wouldn't it, to be able to turn stones into bread and solve the a uh, problem of starvation around the world that's been a problem that we have had for decades and decades and decades, and we never seem to make much progress on it. Starvation and world hunger is still at the forefront of third world countries. But somehow Jesus would have to give up some of his identity uh, and, and do what he wants to do rather than following God's timing. So, Here's my point. You cannot be tempted by something you're already disgusted by. But if there is something in you and what you are relating to is your identity, that is where temptation will come. Deep down inside of us is all kinds of needs. And those needs are more than physical needs. They are emotional and social as well. Here's the problem. The problem is, we can do good things, but do we try to do it apart from God? 
And that's what the devil is tempting Jesus to do. There are a lot of people that do great things through in the world. There's philanthropists and there's been people that have done tremendous things to advance the cause of good in the world. But there are a lot of people that do not do it within God's power and dependence. Does that make sense? So what Jesus is doing is following his Father's will. Following chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, Matthew and the other gospel accounts will give us record of many of the miracles that Jesus does. Secondly, he is taken to the high point of the temple. And then the devil says, throw yourself down, God's going to come to your rescue. Now, each time Jesus will quote from the book of Deuteronomy to resist the temptation, but the devil knows how to uh, quote scripture as well. This verse here, he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift up you in their hands that you will not strike your foot against a stone. This is a quote out of Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12. So here the tempter is using that which gives Jesus strength, the scriptures, against him. Now, what is taking place here is Jesus at the high point of history here <clears throat> is able to look down at the parade of events that have come and gone through the course of history. And as he does so, he can see that he could do a lot because he could be a better king or ruler than what he has seen uh, over the course of the centuries. Here's the idea. You can take your position and you can prove to the rest of the watching world that God is going to protect you no matter what. So there's this old, old hymn. I'm, I think some of you will remember this one. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world. Do you remember that old hymn? He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world, but he died alone for you and me. In other words, very subtly in this is, why don't you call that angelic arm, army to your, uh, uh, to your aid here? And then that's where temptation number three comes in, and that is you can become the ruler of the world. But one proviso, you have to worship me. So here in temptation number two is a setup for temptation number three, and that is he is at a high point on the temple, he looks down, the, an the angelic host could come and rescue him if he was to throw himself off, proving to the watching world that he indeed has heaven on his side. But, temptation number three, is if you want this ring of power, the one ring that rules them all, you have to bow down and worship me. In other words, here's what I want you to do, Jesus. You can own the kingdoms of the world, but I want you to be the secretary of war. I'm going to be the king. I'm going to be the king. So Satan tempts him to be the secretary of war, to take over the kingdoms of the world. If Jesus did that, he would be a military war hero, just like Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar or any other international war hero, but he would not have changed the world. He only would have continued to advance war and violence. You know what all three of these have? in common, shortcutting God's will. Is Jesus the King of kings and Lord of lords? Yes. Paul says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. However, it's shortcutting the way to that. Every person at times needs a desert experience to shape their character. Now, here's where different people will use a different frame around the painting of the temptation of Jesus. And that is, well, Jesus was God. It, that temptation wasn't real. I mean, he could resist easily. But he was also fully human. And what we find is he experienced temptation to the uttermost. And in that temptation, he could have 
turned on God's will if he wanted to. Here he is on the top of the mountain. Temptation number three, shown all the kingdoms of the world. Mountain. Oh, that plays a significant symbolism as well. You see, it was on a mountain that the law was given, Mount Sinai. But did you notice, if you read in the book of Exodus, when the Mosaic Covenant is given on Mount Sinai, the people quaked at the bottom of the mountain in fear and trembling. What we find is a whole different way Jesus is going to rule the world. And it's not going to be through guns, and it's not going to be through violence. It's going to be through character. It's going to be through compassion. It's going to be through love. That's why I say all three of these are related to his identity. Most temptations we struggle with are related to identity. Some of us want to be identified as a certain kind of person. All of us want to be identified as a certain kind of person. You make the choice of what you want to be identified by. Do we want to be identified by the kind of person that goes to a Willie Nelson's concert or an Andre, Andre Bocelli concert? You see what I'm saying? We all kind of have our own preferences and images. And all of this informs who we are, who we think we are, and who we want to be. It shapes how we vote. It shapes what we buy. It shapes sometimes who we marry. It shapes the activities we choose to be involved in. It it shapes where we want to go on vacation or not go on vacation. None of these things are bad in and of themselves, just like the temptations here. But am I giving up my identity if I think I always have to have the latest and most impressive car? Are you, are you following what I'm saying? My identity has to be rooted some, into something deeper than what I own. And so our identity informs all this, shapes all this, but... There's a bigger identity, and the bigger identity is just as Jesus is the Son of God, He calls you, He calls me, sons and daughters of God. That's our primary identity, and then when we step into that, we don't have to be pulled into temptation one way or another. So I thought one way I could illustrate this identity pull that we all have is my own last name. P-O-Z-Z-A. If I had a nickel for every time someone has asked me, is that Italian? And uh, I always respond, it's Italian enough to have a, a vowel at the end of my last name. I've done a lot of ancestry research and stuff like that, and I can never get back to that dominant perspective of my family being Italian. I have an Italian last name, but I'm a mutt. I'm a mutt. And what we find is that we try then sometimes to be related to a primary identity. So I went to high school in Akron, and when I was growing up, North Hill Akron was primarily an Italian neighborhood. And all the kids, I not all the kids, but a majority of the kids that I went to high school with had some type of an Italian heritage to them. And I kind of fit in. And I had that last name, but I didn't look Italian. That's because of the mutt in me, right? These other guys that I went to high school with, they were already shaving and going bald in their senior year. It was amazing, really. But... What I found going to school with a bunch of guys that had Italian heritage is not even their Italian ethnicity was good enough. So even in discussions with some of these individuals, some of them distinguish between being Italian and others being Sicilian. Because you know, Sicilians are better than Italians. I'm going, what? I can't tell the two of you apart if you stood in a police lineup. You look, both look Italian to me, right? Ah, but that's the way we work, don't we? It is our identity that shapes so much of 
who we are. And so, like I told you, I've done a lot of ancestry research, and I can never get back farther than my great-grandfather, who was Italian. He was a short little Dago. I can say that. And, um, and yet, at the same time, I can't get beyond him. And so where are all these other streams coming from? So I finally had my chance. So when I was looking at where the last name Posa comes from, I saw that in Italy, the last name Posa is sort of like Jones here. There's a lot of them, right? So Essie and I had the privilege of going on a tour of Croatia in 2013, and our last stop was in Venice. Here's my chance. So we're in St. Mark's Square in Venice. And we have a tour guide that's showing us the church there and commenting on some other things in and around there. And so here's my chance, and I, I see the opportunity, and I go up to the tour guide, and I say, hey, my last name is Poza. I said, uh, I've always wondered what that meant. And she just kind of looks without an expression on her face, and she goes, a puddle of water. My last name has no significance other than a puddle of water? Are you kidding me? I mean, it's not like I'm an ocean, like Ocean's Eleven, or a river, or just a puddle of water. And you go, right? But then I began thinking, you know what, it doesn't really matter, although I'd like to know and be able to go back farther in my ancestry. You know what? My identity is, I'm the son of Tony and Charlotte Poza. I'm the son of Tony and Charlotte Poza. And that's what's most important. You, need, you see, I'm mostly a mutt mix. Even if I have an Italian heritage, heritage enough to have a last name with a vowel. But I know some individuals who want a better identification than the son of Tony and Charlotte Poza, or whoever your parents are. But to Jesus, that was what was most important. He was the son of God. And as long as he identified with that, that was what was most important. So here's the way I'd like to end, and we are going to take communion here in a moment. There's a book that was put out by Nadia Bowles Weber, called Pastrix, and uh, she was talking about this text, and here's what she said. Identity, it's always God's first move. Before we do anything wrong and before we do anything right, God has named and claimed us as God's own. But almost immediately, other things try to tell us who we are and to whom we belong. Capitalism, the weight loss industrial complex, our parents, kids at school, they all have a go at telling us who we are. But only God can do that. Everything else is temptation. The precision with which the devil or evil or darkness, whatever you want to call it, worms into our lives is breathtaking. It's like a tailor-made radioactive isotope calling into question our identity as children of God. And nowhere are we more prone to encroaching darkness than when we are stepping into the light. Sudden, discour uh, sudden discouragement in the midst of healthy decisions, a toxic thought, or a particular temptation. Would you stand with me? That's, I think, why Jesus taught us to pray this way. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And here it is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever Amen. Let me pray for our communion elements, and you can come up. Just be careful of the wires here. Why don't we come around this way, take a piece of bread, take a cup, hold it, and we will uh, celebrate the Lord together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the bread and the cup as a reminder around the table that we are your children. Help that to be our primary identity. 
Help that to shape who we are and who we think we are to become. We pray, Father, we might have security in that. So give us assurance today, Father, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you that Jesus came into this world and gave his body and blood to remind us that we belong to the family of God. And we lean into that and pray to the glory of Christ in his name. Amen. Come on up, please. So we take a piece of bread, a reminder of that temptation, take the stone and turn it into bread. But Jesus already said, the bread of life is himself. He is the bread of life. And so we partake of him in communion, and we are reminded that man does not live by physical bread alone, but this becomes a symbol of what we really need, the bread of life. So let's take and let's eat together in remembrance of Jesus. We take a cup which reminds us that this bloody canvas that portrays the sacrifice of Christ in his arrest, his burial, but eventually his resurrection is a reminder that indeed, in the end, Jesus Christ is Lord. And so we take this cup as a reminder of our renewal and commitment to him, and we are thankful for his sacrifice. Let's drink together. Would you stand as I close, please? I want to close with one last quote. This uh, again comes from Nadia Bowles Weber and her book. She says, maybe demons are defined as anything other than God that tries to tell us who we are. And maybe just moments after Jesus' baptism, when the devil says to himself, if you are the son of God, he does so because he knows that Jesus is vulnerable to temptation precisely to the degree that he is insecure about his identity and mistrusts his relationship with God. So if God's first move is to give us our identity, then the devil's first move is to throw that identity into question. Lord, have mercy. Protect us from the wiles, subtlety of the devil. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.